You can turn in your Bibles to John chapter 13, and we'll, we'll get dug into the word here. But again, he spoke on why is this Christian walk so difficult? Specifically, why is this love walk so difficult on Sunday? And kind of his anchor scripture was John chapter 13. If you turn in your Bibles there, we'll start 34 and 35. I'm going to reread what, what he talked about. But he said uh, uh, this. He said, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. This is Jesus talking. He said, I've given you a new commandment. Again, not a suggestion, not maybe you want to do this, if you want to do it or, or not or whatever. This is a commandment that you love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another, here it is, will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So our love for one another, our unity, how we interact with one another, that's going to prove to the world that we are Christ's disciples. They should see something different in us. Amen? If we're always running around and, and, and we're arguing and, and, and we're bickering with one another, Darnell, hop up a second. So we got two Christian brothers here and, and we're sitting here arguing and he's saying, you know, he doesn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and I'm saying it's another way. And so we're going back and forth, back and forth. When we're arguing with one another, who is our focus off of? It's off of you guys, right? right. It's off of the world and, and people are walking by us as we're arguing and they're not seeing any different w- with us. Go ahead and sit down because we're just... We're just like the world. We're bickering. We're arguing about, you know, things that, that may or may not affect eternity. More than likely, to, you know, it's, it's about Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen? And, and all the other stuff is not necessarily a, a make or break heaven or hell thing. And so it's, again, as we're sitting here arguing with one another, the world is seeing that. What did Pastor Mike say on, on Sunday? That that when he got saved, he was still smoking weed with, with his buddies, and he asked God, he said, why aren't my buddies, why aren't they responsive to this? Why aren't they listening? And God spoke to him, he said, you're just like them. See, if Darnell are up here, and I are up here arguing, and we're just like the world, we're no different than the world, why would they be attracted to anything that we've got? We are to be set apart. Amen. And we need to, to seek understanding and find more things that we have in common rather than, than the things that we've got differences about. Because people are watching you, right? And you're either a bridge or a barrier. They're watching you, right? Austin Horsley, people are watching. You never know who's watching, amen? Amen. amen? And you're either a bridge to God or you're a barrier to him. And they're watching your actions. You know, they always say, your walk talks louder than your talk talks, right? right. People are watching your actions. And did you know that in the first century church, it only took them roughly 30 years to evangelize the whole known world at that time. There was no TV, no internet, no smartphones, none of that stuff. And the reason being is because they loved one another. And that love was so evident that it attracted people like honey attracts bees. And that's how it is to be with us. And this, isn't a, this is just to bring us up to a higher level of love, of, of what we walk in and in unity. Amen? Amen. So tonight, specifically, we're going to talk about this royal law of love. It talks about that in James 2. We're not going to go there, but, but it talks about that royal law of love. And before we get into that, have you ever asked yourself the question or, or wondered why God created mankind in the first place? Why did God create us? You know, he knew the end from the beginning. He knew that, that Adam and Eve were going to transgress and disobey him, that Satan was going to take authority, that he was going to have to send his very best gift, his son, into the earth to redeem mankind back. You know, he, w- with Noah before the flood, he, he, it said he was sorry that he ever made mankind. So why did he create man in the first place? Do you ever, you ever ask yourself those questions? I'm not going to ask for a show, show of hands, but you should be able to confidently say why it is that God created mankind. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, we, we find the answer to this question. Why did God create man? Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For, for thou, meaning God, has created all things. And for thy pleasure, meaning his pleasure, they are and were created. That's the answer. We were created for God's pleasure. It's as simple as that. Right there in Revelation 4. Adam and Eve were initially, they were created to have fellowship with God. He wanted to have a family. He created Adam and Eve, he put them in the garden, he expected them to be fruitful and multiply, right? Multiply and and end up, you know, inhabiting, I believe that the Garden of Eden would have eventually went around the whole world. You know, it's it's that duplication system, right? Over time. But we know the rest of that story. But again, mankind was created because God wanted someone 
to love and for them to love him back and to do it voluntarily, this word love. For them to love him and for him to love them, it's a two-way street. That's called a relationship, right? A relationship. That's what God wanted to have. And so again, God's purpose for creating mankind and human beings was all about having a relationship. That's why he created us initially. And he did it out of love. See, religion is all about doing. There's a big difference there. Religion says, you know, you've got to do this, you know, get baptized as an infant and go through confirmation and, and, and all these things are maybe good things to do, but they don't earn our relationship or earn the love of our follower. That, that's, that's us trying to do and work our way to God. Where a relationship said it's, it says it's already been done. Amen. So religion is about doing, relationships about being. We are human beings, we're not human doings, right? It's about being who you are in Christ, a human being. He loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He loves you because he created you. That's it. Don't add anything to it. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We, we've talked about this the last few, few services. For by grace you are saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not by works, lest any man should boast. We don't add anything to it. It's that free gift of salvation, that free gift of grace that, that he provided. He wanted to have that relationship. Romans chapter five, verse eight, as, as we look at this, it says, but God demonstrates, or I love that word, it means he showed us by example. He demonstrates his own love towards us. This is how much he loved us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Think about that. He created us because he wants to have a relationship with us, knowing that Adam and Eve were gonna transgress God that he was going to have to send his son into the earth, but he loved us so much that he created us even in spite of all that because he wanted to have a relationship with us. Interesting, huh? But God's love, it's, it's never been conditional. It's, it's not like the relig religion stuff. It's never been conditional. It's always been based on what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. You know, I, you guys have heard my story many times, but November 20th of 2001, you know, and where I was, I was a... a Champion bodybuilder on the outside looked like I had everything together, right? Kind of the success of what the world says. You know, the big guy with the beautiful, you know, just had gotten engaged, fiance by the grace of God, now my wife. I remember on, on Saturday night, you know, we're down at jams, pocket full of pills, pocket full of money. Everybody wants to be around you. Tuesday morning, November 20th of 2001, get arrested for drug trafficking. I'm on Kelloland News and shackles and handcuffs. Now all of a sudden, nobody knows you, right? Where's all my friends at now? Behind the scenes, what am I doing? Dealing drugs, you know, messing around on, on Melissa behind her back. This was BC before Christ. And on and on and on. I didn't have anything to bring to the table. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much he loves us. We've got to understand the love that God has for us. Amen. Didn't have anything to bring, yet he came in and, and flooded my life. I remember getting down on my knees and I said, God, I've made a mess of my life. If you can do anything with it, you can have it. And everything began to change. Amen. Amen. You know, Pastor Mike came down and, and ministered to me and, you know, a lot of the rest of the story. Praise God, Melissa and I stuck together and, and got married and and uh, she got down to this church, and, and everything's changed as a result of that. Amen? Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. But again, it's knowing the love that God has for us. We don't bring anything to the table. And we always have to remember where we came from. Never forget where you were at. Because that'll make you more empathetic towards the world. Amen. And our love towards them. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17 says this. It says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. You may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the width and length and depth and height. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Another translation says it's, it's too great to understand. That the love of Christ is too great to understand. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The point I'm trying to get here is that you've got to have a revelation of God's love towards you. When pastors and Melissa and I were down at, at uh, the KCM Ministers Conference here a few weeks ago, Mac Hammond said this statement, and I thought it was profound. He, he spoke about love. He said, the revelation you have of how much God loves you 
will be in direct correlation with how much you love others. You think about that. The revelation of, of how much or understanding of how much God loves you, that will directly correlate with how you love others. You can't give out what you don't have. And God is love. When he comes into our life, we've got to understand the love that he has for us that's been, been shed abroad in our hearts, amen? And God loves you. You're, you're perfect in his eyes. You're accepted in the beloved. Why is this? Well, love is a decision. It's, it's not an emotion. And God decided to love you even though you didn't deserve it. Like I just explained, where I was at BC before Christ. And many of you have, have maybe similar stories or, or whatever. The story of, of, of where your life was at and then Jesus Christ and now, right? Before Christ, we were sinners. But God so loved us that he sent his son. That's how much he loved us. And you've got to have an understanding of that. If you don't understand the, the, the revelation and you know, how wide and deep and, and long that love for, for you is, you're not going to be able to share it with the world because you're going to pour out what you've got in. And if you don't have in, in there much, there's just not much to pour out. Think about this. If you, if you feel like you have to earn forgiveness from God, you're going to make others feel like they've got to earn forgiveness from you, right? Right? Because how you see God is, is how you're going to operate with other people. You know, I was that way a lot of times with, with my oldest son, Noah. You know, teenage years for a boy, they're, they're trying to figure out life and, and where they're going. You know, do I have the same belief system as, as my parents do? And, and just all this stuff, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old. One day they feel like they're nine years old. The next day they feel like they're 29, right? Who, who can relate that's, got, that's had sons? I've never had daughters, so I don't know the emotional carnage that that could be in, in, in life. But um, I digress, amen. But anyway... I remember, you know, I was always performance-based, right? Everything I did in life, it was just pursuing. You know, as a bodybuilder and as an athlete, you want to win. So when I came into to God, you know, you bring your culture and your belief system a lot of times into your relationship with God. You know, pastor always says that. You bring your culture into your Christianity. So when I became a Christian, it was like you kind of operate the same way. You know, disciplined. You know, I used to diet for three or four months at a time and just kind of flip the switch and be disciplined. But it's, it was discipline in myself, not necessarily disciplined by the grace of God and him empowering me, empowering me to do what he wanted me to do. And so I would project that onto my family, specifically onto Noah. So I remember one day he was down playing video games and, you know, I was on him for, for doing something. And, and, you know, I remember him turning to me and looking at me and saying, hey, you know, what do you want? And I was like, you know, I don't really know. And it was, it was like just that realization that I was setting expectations so high and I was projecting that onto him that, that no matter what he did, it was never good enough, right? Because that's how I felt like in my relationship with God, that I've got I've to earn his love. I've got to earn his favor. I've got to just do, do more stuff. If I pray enough, if I read enough, all those things are good things. But again, we need to rest in the fact, we need to labor to enter into that rest that we are accepted just the way we are. Now, praise God, he doesn't leave us the way that we are, right? When you get born again, the, the Holy Spirit comes in and there should be fruit as evidence as a result of that. Good works should be the result of your salvation. Amen. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. There, there should be fruit as a result of that. Otherwise, you should check your salvation Amen. and make sure that you are in Christ. And we'll give you an opportunity to do that at the end of the night. But again, you know, I, I just thought about that where it was like, man, all he wanted to do is, was be loved by his dad and accepted by his dad and, and have that foundation and then we can, we can work from that. There's, a, there's an old psychology thing that was done you know, by, by where they were training some dogs. And I think about this where, you know, obviously if, if, if the dog does what it's supposed to do, it gets a treat, right? If it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, it, it would get a shock. And so then they, they were doing some experiments and they were like, okay, we're going to shock it no matter what it does. If it does the right thing, it's going to get a shock. If it does the wrong thing, it's going to get a shock. And what, what did the dog do? It was confused. And eventually it just laid down and they call that learned helplessness. And that's the position I really, I, I put Noah in. No matter what I do, it's not going to be good enough. And so again, what did I say there? If you feel like you have to earn forgiveness from God, you'll make others earn forgiveness from you. And that's why it's so important to understand the revelation of God's love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That doesn't change. 
Yes, we're saints once you're born again, but he still loves you just the same. He doesn't love you anymore now that you're a Christian versus when you weren't. And that's hard for our carnal minds and our natural minds to wrap our heads around. Amen? Amen. I was talking to a guy you know, before service that's having some challenges and, and, and with his daughter. And, and he said, you know, my, my daughter just lashes out and she says, she tells him that she hates him and whatnot. And I said, hey man, she doesn't hate you, she hates herself. Amen. It's how she views herself. Right. And I said, we can do all these different things, but until Jesus Christ comes into her heart and takes that hard, stony heart and transforms that and, and circumcises that heart and, and puts his soft heart in there, there'll be no change. So it's, it's praying for him. As somebody prayed for me, right. as somebody prayed for all of you. Amen. The Bible says that the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. And we pray for laborers to come across their path. And that's what I prayed for him for, was that a labor would come across her path in the situation she's in, somebody she looks to, and that her heart would be open. Amen. Because we were all there not very long ago. Right. We never want to forget what, where we came from. Amen. Amen? Amen? The Old Testament law versus this royal law of love. What, is, what does that look like? Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. I know this is basic, but again, we're back to the basics. Being fearless, full of faith, surrounded by favor, right? 2023 is the year that we, that we need, as Pastor Vicky had, had gotten in prayer. Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus was just asked by the, the religious Pharisees, he was asked, Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? And of course, they're trying to trip him up. What were they looking for? The thou shalt not. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not uh, you know, bear false witness. Thou shalt not steal. They were, they were looking for the don'ts. That's what religion always does. Right. Don't the don'ts. Right. But what did Jesus come back around and say? Verse 37, he said, Jesus said unto them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is what you do. You love God with everything that you are, heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The gist of this is there's nothing more important than learning how to love. And that's the key word. It's learning. Amen. It's not natural. It's not normal. We have to learn how to love. You, any parents know when you have kids, you didn't have to teach them how to you know, again, be greedy and, and fight over their toys, right? You had to teach them. They had to learn. We had to train them up in how to get along, and, and, and we correct them in that. So we have to learn how to love. The importance of it is, is because nothing works without love. We talked last week about faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Everything works by love. Remember, what, what was hope? Hope is a confident expectation. Hope is, is, is seeing in our mind's eye. It's, it's the blueprint of what we're building. It's, it's seeing Faith Family Church filled to the rafters. Amen. It's seeing people coming here and getting healed, getting delivered, getting saved, miracles happening here, energy, passion, excitement, the love of Christ shed in our hearts, right? It's seeing that. That's the hope. And then our faith goes and, and brings what we hope for from the unseen into the seen realm. And faith without corresponding action is dead. We've got to do our part, believing and trusting God that he'll do his part. Amen? Right. Amen? That's right. But it all works by love. If there's not love, there's no faith, there's no, nobody to put your hope in because God is love. Amen. And when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit, God, comes to live inside of you. You're, you're a vessel of love. Amen. But it's understanding that and operating in it. Love never fails. That's intriguing, right? It says if you love, it's impossible to fail. I mean, now you've got me, me curious. What, what, what is this love that never fails? And pastors taught on this many times, this, this agape love. Agape love is the God kind of love. It's, it's, it's to give. It's directed outward toward others and, and putting their needs ahead of yourself. The word that comes to me is, is, is being selfless, right? Ed Cole, who's... Uh, just a man's, I mean, he was like anointed to teach men. He's passed on in, in heaven now, but his, his books are fantastic. He said this, he said that the God kind of love is giving to benefit others at the expense of self. Think about that. Giving to benefit others at the expense of, of self, that's selfless. It's easily satisfied. My wife always would tell our boys, it's not about you. And it's not about you. It's not about me. 
It's about him. It's about other people. Now, we got to keep it balanced. That doesn't mean you, you're a doormat and, and you just run yourself ragged. You, you stay in the middle with this. But again, it's not about us. If it's within your, your means and, and, and ability to be able to help somebody, that's what love does. Amen? 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, it says this. We know that what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our bro- brothers and sisters. English class here real quick, lesson. A noun is a person, place, or thing, right? This love here, it's, it's a verb. It's not only a verb, it's an action verb. Action verbs are like running, walking, dancing, skipping around. Love is an action. It's not an emotion. It's an attitude that reveals itself in action. It says, Jesus gave up his life for us. And so because of that, we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. That's unity. That's love. That's attractive. That'll make the world jealous of what it is that we have. We should be competing to outlove one another. Think about that. With no selfishness, no selfish motives whatsoever. Some ideas, it's, it's helping others when it's not convenient. When you help somebody else move, it's typically not convenient, but you go help them anyway, amen? amen. Taking the high road. Yes. Being above and not beneath. Being the head and not the tail. Turning the other cheek even when you're right. You don't turn there, but Proverbs 26 says this, don't answer the foolish arguments of fools or you will become as foolish as they are. This is not about convincing the world with our words. Again, it's about convincing them with our actions, leading by example. That's how how pastors have done this for the last 42 years. They've led by example. Amen? On the the other side, so it says, God kind of love is, is giving to benefit others at the expense of self, but lust, on the flip side, is the desire to benefit self even at the expense of others. Because lust only wants to get. It only wants to take. It's selfish. The word immaturity is really what comes to me. As you mature in Christ, you should become more selfless, right? Before Christ, we were all very selfish. And lust is insatiable, and it can never be satisfied. You think about that. It just keeps taking and taking and taking. It's never had enough. But here's the deal. When when the world sees agape love... It doesn't make any sense to them because it's not natural. It's not normal. And that's why, again, we have to learn to love like God loves. This is the God kind of love. It's it's agape. And this is why the world is so suspect when they come in and encounter with you as a Christian. When they come to church for the first few times, they're wondering, what is going on here? Because this is not normal. It's not normal to, for people to be kind to them and, and you know, greet them and, and take a genuine interest in them without wanting something in return, right? Lust takes from others at their expense. Love gives to others at our expense. Amen. They're not used to it. It's not natural. It's not normal. Right. I remember when, you know, Melissa first started coming here. She was going to another church that we were going to just because we needed a place to get married and then when I got in trouble, I was like, hey, you need to come down to, to church here. I know Pastor Mike's legit. I know he's, he's doing this thing. He used to come to my gym. And I, I just knew, you know, this is where she needed to be at. And so she came here on Wednesday. She went to our old church on Sunday. She wasn't church. She didn't know anything about the Word of God. But you know what she experienced? Love. She experienced people t- taking her in, you know, Angie and Amy and Becky and, and, and all you women just, just taking her in and accepting her. That doesn't mean we leave people where they're at. Remember, we had a message on on the balance between love or or grace and truth. Grace, you know, grace brings them in and then we give them the truth. But again, that's what she experienced. And after three or four times, she was like, I'm not going to that other church anymore. Faith Family Church is my church now. Amen. Amen? Because of love. And then guess what? The word of God started to get into her. And it started to transform her heart. She got born again and, and, and you know, was taught and discipled. And that's how the whole process goes. Simple thing, amen? But, but it all operates by love. So this God kind of love or, or this agape, turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 
the love chapter. I know you probably all know this, but are you doing what you know to do, right? It's one thing to know it, but it's another thing to do it. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, it says this. Love is patient and kind. It's an action. Are you patient and kind? How about in the most important spot and behind the four walls? Patient and kind with your, with your spouse and with your kids. The people that know us the, the, the best, are you patient and kind with them? That's what love is. That's, see, this is God. This is, this is explaining this God kind of love. Of, of who he is. Love is. God is patient and kind, and, and we're to be like him. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Amen. Think about that. You've been around any rude people or, 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 or bo- boasters, and they're not attractive. Nobody wants to be around them, right? right? So we don't want to be those things. We don't want to get jealous of the things that the world has going on because, again, God has a path for you. It is filled with blessing. It may take a little bit longer or seem like it's going to take a little bit longer, but God is developing your character up along the way. Why? Because he loves you. Amen. He's not going to bring more into your life to, to destroy you. He knows what it is that, that you have need of. He knows what you can handle, and he's going to take you down that path. It says, it does not demand its own way. It's not bossy. It's not pushy. Love is patient, amen? It's not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. Wow, that's a huge one. You think about that in relationships. Well, what you did to me five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, rehashing those things, bringing it up. Aren't you glad that God doesn't bring up the things that, that we did before Christ? It says he, he separates our sins as far as the east is from the west. He throws them in the sea of forgetfulness. He can't even remember them. You bring them up to him and you know, I feel unworthy, I feel this. And, and he's like, what are you even talking about? I don't even remember that stuff. Imagine if your kid came to you Dad, you're so awesome, you're so amazing, but I'm just so unworthy, I'm just a worm, I'm just worthless. You'd be like, who told you that, right? Right. That's not how we approach God. I understand he's a holy God, but again, he loves you. We're not afraid of God that we're gonna mess up and make a mistake, no. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we have access into the holy of holies, amen? The veil was torn for us because of the blood of Jesus. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. Verse 6, it says, It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. That's a big one. It doesn't cheer when when, when people fall and and when people are down. Pastor's such a good example of it. When he hears about other ministers, if if somebody falls into maybe sexual sin or whatever it is, he doesn't sit and, oh, I I knew that, or or, and and be judgmental and and condescending because he's, he's very humble about it and realizing that, hey, if that can happen to them, that could happen to one of us. Amen? We need to be careful with that. Doesn't rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. God will never give up on you. Never gives up. It it never loses faith. That's God. And the Holy Spirit in us is the same way. We never lose faith. We're always hopeful. Our situations are going to turn around. That guy I just spoke to before church, that was my encouragement. I said, don't lose hope, man. I said, if you, you get down or whatever, give me a phone call. I said, I'll keep checking in with you. And I prayed with him, but he, he said, man, I just need to be, he calls this positivity, and that's okay. Amen. That's how the world explains it. He doesn't, he doesn't quite understand what, what's going on here, but he will. Amen. Because we're, we're going to love him, yeah. and we're going to bring him along, amen? amen? It's always hopeful, and it endures through every circumstance. Finally, love never fails. That's powerful. Amen. It never fails. Imagine if you went out to do something knowing that you could not fail. There was no way that you could fail. That's how it is if you have God in your life. Amen. If he tells you to do something and, and the Holy Spirit lives in you, that love will never fail. Loving other people will never fail. You, you're never going to lose by loving somebody else. Amen. Amen? Amen? And again, this is how God loves us and this is how we're supposed to love other people. Now you might hear this and go, boy, this, this sounds hard. You know, this is like a, a high standard. And, and it is. I'm reading this book uh, that I got down in, in Dallas. It's called uh, The Pastor's Heart by 
uh, Happy Caldwell. I'd, I'd, I'd heard of him before, but I didn't know a whole lot about him. Pastor Vicky loves him and always talks about how he, you know, he's got the pastor's heart. And so when he shares, it's, it's from the heart of a pastor, which I didn't really correlate. But, but reading some things in this book, I'm like, God, that is, that is hard. You know, talking about, you know, how a, how a pastor is accountable, you know, for the, the people and just all these, these various things. I'm like, God, is that, that's hard. And always, right in my spirit, this is what comes up. And you know the scripture, it says, uh, uh, he said it to Paul. When Paul had that thorn in the flesh, he, he said, three times I, I pleaded with God. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And that's what God is saying as well. He would never command us to do something that he won't empower us to do, to, to walk out. So he commands us to love one another, but he also gives us the grace and the empowerment to walk this out. Just do it one day at a time. Don't worry about next week, next month, or next year. Focus on love today. Then wake up and focus on love tomorrow. And then the next day. Then you got a week, it turns into a month, turns into a year, and you won't even recognize your life because you're walking in love. And it's pleasing to God. Amen? Not that we earn anything from God, but it's just, again, this is attractive. It's attractive to the world. This is how we're going to win them. The application of this, it, there's a, a thing that says, attention follows intention. Said another way is, is what we intend to find is what our mind tends to focus on. This is a way of explaining Romans 12 too, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In psychology, they have something called the reticular activating system. This is how it works. So I owned a, a gym out on, on Marion Road. It's been a, it was a powerhouse gym from 1996 to, to mid-2000s. I was part owner of it from 96 to 2000. That's actually when I met Pastor Mike. Uh, and then, you know, we owned it as Complete Fitness. It was just ironic that we came back around. You know, God's got a, an interesting way of, of, of uh, moving things around and whatnot. But I, I remember people would come in and, and they'd ask, they'd be like, how long's this gym been here? I'd say since 1996, you know, maybe, maybe it was 20 plus years. They're like, I've lived in this area my whole life and I've never noticed it before. But all of a sudden, they were ready to maybe lose weight or, or get fit or get healthy or, or whatever it was. And now all of a sudden, what pops up? The answer to, to what it is that they're looking for. Maybe explain another way, you know, if you, you go out and buy a car, maybe you buy a, a, a silver Honda Odyssey. Now you're driving around that car and you're seeing silver Honda Odysseys everywhere, right? That's, that's your reticular activating system. It, it all of a sudden woke up. Those cars were always there. The gym had been there for, for 20 plus years, but they didn't notice it before. So how does, how does this become our main thing, where we're, we're noticing other people and, and, and we're operating and we're walking in love. Well, my challenge is this. It's, it's February, it's Valentine's month, it's, it's love month, so commit these verses to memory. What's Joshua 1.8 say? This book of the law shall not depart from thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night and observe to do according to all that is written therein. If you do all that, then you shall make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So commit these, these verses, this 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 through 8. You start reading these on a daily basis. That's my challenge to you. It's four verses. Pick the translation. You know, love is patient, love is kind. And then it'll start getting into you. And then when you're out in your workplace and around your family and, and, and stuff that, that pops up that normally annoys you, all of a sudden you're like, nope. Love is patient and love is kind. That still small voice will come up in there and, and that's, that's how you change. That's how change occurs. We put the word of God in and it, it pushes all the old garbage thinking out. And all of a sudden we're aware of love and we're looking for ways that we can love people. And we're intentional about it. Just like seeing that, that gray or silver Honda Odyssey everywhere. It's, it works the exact same way. That's why we focus and, and we put the scriptures in. Amen? Say it again, the revelation you have of how much God loves you will be a direct correlation with how much you love other people. If you understand that, that you're loved unconditionally and, and you're accepted, that's how you'll treat other people. You show them grace, obviously bring in truth as well. It's a balance, but that's how we love people. Final thing, I used to teach this in, in leadership development thing. We, we called it green lens, red lens goes like this. You, you, you view people through, through this lens of love. 
the red lens is, is very critical. This is what it sounds like. Imagine if I'm, I'm saying this to you and, or thinking this about you when I'm talking to you. This is the critical way. There's something wrong with this person. They don't have their own answers, but I do and it's up to me to fix them. This person is a drain on me and I cannot wait to end this conversation with them. How's that gonna make you feel if I'm putting that vibe out? If I'm seeing you through that lens, that red lens? Not very good, right? Not very attracted. You're gonna know that I, can, I just can't wait to get away from you, right? So if you're critical like that, that's it's switching it over to the green lens, the, the, the lens of love. This is what that sounds like. This person is a hero, whole and complete. They have dreams and goals and a desire to make a difference. This person is greater than their thoughts, fears, feelings, and behaviors. This person is adding value to me right now. They deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. Imagine if you walked away and around and, and that's how you operated, was, was seeing people through that green lens, through that lens of love, seeing them as valuable, seeing them the way God sees them. That's the key. Because God is love. God commended this love toward us in this, why we were yet sinners. He didn't see you where you were at. He saw you where you were going. He knows the end from the beginning. Pastor's got such an innate ability to do that. When he used to come and visit me in prison, I got an orange t-shirt on with inmate on my back. He, why was he coming to see me? He saw where I was going, not where I was at. He didn't know if I was going to stick with this or not. If it was just going to be jailhouse religion or, or what. And him believing in me, seeing me through that lens of love, that's why I'm here today. That's what's going to build this church. Amen. That's what's going to build the church. We're going to do the digital things. We're going to do the Super Sunday. We're going to do all that stuff. But we've got to do our part, amen? amen. Behaving the way God behaves towards us. Walking in love. Amen. Ephesians 6, 12 says, We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. The person next to you is not your problem. The person at work, your boss, they're not your problem. You don't need a, a, a change of atmosphere. You need a change of heart. It's growing up in, in this lens of love in a higher level. And I'm telling you, the next 21 days through the end of February, if you'll, you'll speak these scriptures out on a daily basis, it will change you. It'll bring you up to a higher level. I'm going to do it. I need to do it. I need to get to a higher level. Amen? Amen. The God kind of love is quick to forgive and slow to take offense. Imagine if we were all like that. Quick to forgive, slow to take offense. And the neat thing about forgiveness is it always leads to love. Be quick to forgive and slow to take offense. I read, I read this and I thought this was powerful. Listen to this. It says, when you settle in your heart and you make the decision to live by this God kind of love, there is no demon in hell that can stop you because the power of God's love in you never fails. Love never fails. And if you're walking in love, you will never fail. How awesome is that? Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching the message. I'd like to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Jesus, I repent of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart. And Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. And I thank you for saving me. If you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got born again make sure you get into a Bible-based church like Faith Family. Open your Bible and read it daily, starting with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Surround yourself with godly friends that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. We trust that you are encouraged, strengthened, and are ready to fight the good fight of faith. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and share this message so we can reach more people to fulfill our mission of strengthening families through God's word. Let us know in the comments below if you gave your life to Jesus or how this message touched your life. We would love to hear from you. God wants you to know that he is for you, not against you. We love you. We are praying for you and your family. We'll see you next time.